Hello, um, my name's Matt. Uh, and before I get going, I'd just like to say thank you. I'd like to say thank you to Sarah and the team at Google for giving me the opportunity to speak to you all today. And also thank you to Shane, who's given us a really insightful start to the, to the next couple of days. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, building powerful brands. And I hope that some of this thinking uh, dovetails nicely and builds upon some of um, Shane's thinking about intent. Because I think really powerful brands are great at doing a couple of different things. Um, to build on Shane's thinking, they're very good at driving and satisfying consumer intent. And the second thing they're very good at is having a powerful brand is very good at helping shift those quick moving performance measures associated with online and digital marketing campaigns. What I'm going to talk about really is about kind of the habits and the behaviours of powerful brands. This is my point of view informed by various sources of research, which I'll uh, reference as we go through it. But I hope it inspires some of your thinking about how to build your own brands and how to make sure that you satisfy consumer intent in the right way. Um, so this is my company, London Strategy Units. We have offices in London and Dublin. These are some of our clients, um, lots of large organizations, often with a portfolio of brands. Um, why we think brands are valuable is not so much always from the marketer's point of view, but it's often from the consumer point of view. Brands are really, really useful to consumers because in a world of infinite choice and mass abundance, Brands are very good at helping consumers um, navigate that choice to make uh, decisions more quickly and hopefully better decisions too. So brands are really good at helping people realise their intent and make the right decision. Um, powerful brands do this really, really well. Powerful brands drive and realise consumer intent particularly well. And because of this, powerful brands tend to acquire market share at a quicker rate than their rivals in their particular markets or categories. But also, they have much more effectiveness in their marketing spends. Their ROI rates are higher. Uh, the money that they spend has a disproportionate effect to many of their rivals. And what I'm interested in finding out and talking to you about is, why is that? What are the habits and the behaviours of these powerful brands that helps them um, acquire this market share and have a disproportionately effective spend. I think really there are kind of five key behaviours and I've tried to link them together but are using uh, the familiar framework of P's that we're used to in marketing. But I think this is a new set of P's to building brand power. I think the first one is about powerful brands having purpose. The second one is about powerful brands focusing on penetration rather than frequency. The third one is about powerful brands building their prominence, putting fame at the heart of their marketing and doing their best to make themselves famous rather than any other objective. And about powerful brands creating opportunities for consumer participation. And that doesn't mean gimmicks, that actually means the development of services that deliver true utility to consumers. And then lastly, powerful brands develop portfolios. Now, my background, I spent a lot of time doing brand planning, and this may run counter to some thoughts about planning, but it's almost that they have portfolios rather than rigid plans that they are uh, reluctant to shift from. So I'm going to talk to you about each of these five Ps and, and what they are and uh, how to start to embody these habits and behaviours in the way that you think about your brand and marketing. So let's start with purpose. We define purpose in a real simple way, which is it's the reason your brand exists over and above making money. Now, it's quite a challenging question for many organisations, but I think it's worth every marketer and everyone supporting a marketing function thinking about the purpose of their brand. Why does it exist over and above making money? Because having a purpose is extremely important. First of all, we know that often our benchmarks in terms of branding, communications, and marketing, those examples that we turn to time and time again, and we often look at and go, I wish our company or our brand was a little bit more like a Coke or a Google or an Innocent in the UK. 
Um, and we know that all of these brands that we use as benchmarks often have a strong guiding purpose at their heart. And it's a purpose which is about uh, that reason to exist over and above making money. And they can vary from kind of the very lofty Starbucks inspire and nurture the human spirit to the more day-to-day um, -day about making it easy for people to do themselves some good. But they're all about a non-financial or non-commercial driver of the brand or the business. And it's important to put that at the heart. Um, and why is this important? It's because not only do the brands that we admire and that we respect and that we use as examples in our presentations are driven by a purpose, but also purpose-driven organisations tend to outperform their non-purpose-driven rivals. So this was a study conducted by Jim Stengel, ex-global uh, chief marketer at P&G, looking, looking at the disproportionate uh, success brands that are purpose-driven have. It's by putting that non-commercial kind of driver at the heart of the brand, you realise greater commercial success. So this is all putting into context the reason why having a brand purpose is important uh, in building a powerful brand. But not just why is it important, but how does it contribute? How does having a purpose contribute to a brand's commercial success? I think there are kind of three key reasons. So rather than the why, I'm going to just touch on the how of purpose. I think it's really interesting because having a, a, a purpose drives what I call share of mind. It gives consumers more opportunities to think about your brand. So um, having a purpose allows you to stretch beyond uh, and gives your marketing permission to go beyond products and features. It allows you to transcend the category that you operate in and allows you to create communications and marketing activity that has a broader relevance to your consumer base. So I use Purcell in this example. So Purcell, a Unilever brand whose purpose is to liberate parents and children to live creatively. So this inspired the hugely effective Dirt is Good campaign. When I talk about share of mind there, what it means is rather than talking about perhaps washes whiter, the efficacy of the granules or delivery mechanism, um, which when you think about parents, reluctantly and rarely think about their washing, they're much more interested in thinking about their children and their children's development. So aligning themselves with the development of children, it gives themselves more opportunity to be thought of by consumers, greater share of minds, which then has uh, an effect on the consumer's decision-making process because they are more easily brought to mind at the moment of choice and purchase. So that's one reason why purpose is an incredibly effective driver of marketing and business success. The second reason, and um, I had chosen this example prior to being asked to speak today, so it is Google, um, is that purpose is a great driver of innovation. Purpose-driven companies tend to be more innovative than their rivals. And this is, the reason this is, is because if you have a purpose, you are looking for new and fresh ways to fulfill that purpose. You are not limited by what you can do currently, what you can do. Your brand is inspired to find new ways to deliver against its purpose. It's inspired to, find, to, to do what it should do rather than be limited to what it can do. So having a purpose pushes you and pushes you further to think about new ways of delivering against that purpose. And, and increases your ability to be, a, to be an innovator. So if the first element of why purpose is important and how purpose drives business success is about marketing effectiveness and the second is about um, innovation, the third, I think, is about organisational efficiency. Having a good crafted purpose, which people can understand across the organisation, is a real strength because it's a real simple way of summing up what the organization and the brand hopes to achieve, what its ambition is, the world it wants to bring into being. And if you can sum that up in a very pithy way, oddly enough, you spend much less time talking about strategy because the strategy is there. It's written in a simple form and you spend more time delivering on the strategy. I think in the world that we live in, you know, rather than getting caught up in over planning, sometimes we need to get to action much more quickly. And so 
having a purpose removes all those uh, time-consuming meetings that are discussing strategy, that are about onboarding, that are about training and bringing up people's understanding of what a brand is about. It's a very good touchstone for direction and decision-making and helps remove some of the internal debate. I love this example, which is uh, the US retailer Nordstrom. This is their staff handbook in its entirety. So they have one rule, which is use good judgment in all situations. So the induction at Nordstrom is incredibly efficient. It doesn't take too much time to get through that. But again, all driven by having a purpose at the heart of the organization and how purpose can help beat time-consuming process that slows down organizations. Now, the second habit, quality or behavior of powerful brands is their focus on penetration. So what they try to do in their marketing and their communications is to get people to buy in, new consumers to come in rather than existing consumers to buy more. So they prioritize uh, penetration over frequency. That's a behavior of powerful brands. Um, why is this? This is a study by Professor Byron Sharp, uh, How Brands Grow, where he uncovers the fact that the success of the majority of brands is based on having a very broad base of light buyers, and he dismisses the idea of consumer loyalty being a driver of success. He thinks that consumers are not loyal. At best, consumers are indifferent to many brands, and brands only have their use when it comes to a particular moment in decision-making. So most brands, their success is about having that, that bottom of the pyramid, that base of light buyers, and always bringing in new people, getting them to buy in, rather than working hard to get existing uh, consumers to buy more. And this is true even for a, a brand that we sometimes look at and see as being particularly iconic and having perhaps very strong advocates. Even for Coke, in the UK, the average annual purchase frequency is just once. So just once a year. And I think, again, there's an interesting observation here to be made when we think about uh, our marketing and our brands and the meetings we find ourselves in. Because I think sometimes we can uh, uh, underestimate the changes in behavior we hope to drive amongst consumers. So, you know, if you're thinking about just getting people to buy one more Coke a year, often that seems trivial or unimportant or easily achieved. But if consumers over the course of the year only buy one anyway, you're asking them to make a really big leap in their behavior to increase their volume uh, purchases by 100%. Okay, so how to drive penetration? What is it that you need to do? If you put that at the heart of powerful brands, how to do it? I think the first thing to do is sometimes we can get blindsided and navigate uh, too much by segmentations and by micro segments within a uh, breakdowns of markets. And I think it's more important that powerful brands and powerful brands tend to think about selling to the market as a whole rather than one individual segment. So this is Nike's mission statement or purpose, to bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. And admittedly, you can see in their communications and their marketing, they always have an athletic tone of voice or insight at the heart of everything that they do. They speak to the inner athlete, but they believe that the inner athlete lurks within us all. If you have a body, you are an athlete. That's what it says in small type there. So rather than thinking about small segments, they're thinking about going, actually, there's an athlete in all of us. We just have to evoke it, encourage people to see themselves as an athlete. So again, thinking about the selling to the market in the broadest base possible to drive penetration. The second thing which I think is interesting is about not navigating by existing consumers. Um, it's always tempting when we think, about developing initiatives, activities, and campaigns to think about, okay, what will current buyers or consumers think? And often, they force us, that thinking limits our creativity, our ability to drive the business forward, because we're always sort of navigating by those people who are already inside of the tent, rather than the potential that lurks outside of it. Um, when I was working on Honda, helping put together the Power of Dreams campaign, which was a large creative step change for that brand. One of the, I suppose, the initial reticences that we experienced was in the UK, Honda was associated with a, a base of older consumers. And what we thought might be a challenge was this idea about going, okay, but if we do a big creative step change in 
the brand and how it communicates, will that be rejected by the current consumers? But we had to put that fear to one side and think about not worrying about navigating by the existing consumers, but thinking about the potential that lies beyond driving penetration by extending out from the base. And by doing that and making that step change, the campaign proved to be incredibly effective with an additional 20,000 units sold in the first uh, two years. The second thing which I think, or the third thing I think which is really interesting about driving penetration is this idea about sort of uh, competing with culture. Um, and I think this is important because if you recognise that actually uh, at best consumers are indifferent to your brand, that there isn't a genuine passionate loyalty or advocacy, um, you realise that people are, are, are largely disengaged from much of uh, many brands' con communications and activity. And actually, the opportunity cost, especially online, of engaging with your brand is not engaging with all the other cool stuff that could be taking up your time. So the opportunity cost of uh, absorbing engaging with brand communications is not doing all that brilliant stuff that you could be doing. So really, the competitive set for brands is not really... Uh, their rival in the category or their rival in the market, but it's culture itself. If you want to win and reward engagement and attention, you've got to be equally, if not better, than all those other things that people could be doing. Um, and I think that's really interesting online where it's so easy to avoid advertising uh, and jump away from content and jump from site to site or platform to platform. Uh, this example I just think is really fun. This is Paddy Power, a bookmaker uh, who before um, the World Cup in Brazil um, pulled together this fake photograph which made it look as if that they had um, bulldozed a large section of the Amazonian rainforest in order to show their support to the English national team. Uh, it caused some outcry, but it caused a lot of enjoyment amongst many football fans uh, and created great debate. Um, so I think this was a great example of some online activity that actually reflected uh, some sentiment from the football uh, fan base uh, and was enjoyed by many and was, a, again, a, a good um, counterpoint or a good part of the uh, repertoire of content that sat around uh, the English national team at that particular point. The second thing, or the last thing, the fourth thing about uh, driving penetration is penetration is best driven not by bombarding people with rational messages, uh, arguing with them or battering them with facts into submission, but persuading them emotionally. So I think, you know, penetration is best driven by emotional persuasion and emotional engagement. I think this is a great campaign by Always, you will have seen it, the Like a Girl, um, which really helps sort of that uh, nice overlap between purpose, uh, female development, uh, as much as emotional persuasion and encouraging people to making people feel something. And I think the great stat about this is going, quite often sometimes we think about going, actually, can we build uh, emotional engagement? Can we persuade people emotionally using uh, online channels? And I think this is a great example of a brand that did that successfully with more than 80 million views worldwide before going on broadcast media. So we've had purpose, and we've had penetration. The third habit that I'd like to talk about is prominence. I think this is about going, okay, what do we put at the heart of our marketing and our objectives for our marketing and our activity? Prominence means using marketing to make your brand easy to think of, find and choose. Sum this up in a slightly different way, which is about fame, making fame the objective of your campaigns, activity and initiatives. Because fame is the most effective campaign objective. Those campaigns which put fame as their key objective tend to be those which are most likely going to be uh, effective. So rather than thinking about awareness or image or a direct response, how do we use our campaigns and how do we go? The aim of this campaign is to make our brand famous. Now fame isn't the same as awareness, which can be bought, can be driven by a uh, share of voice. Fame is not just about kind of that, uh, what you can pay for, but it's also about all those things about how you drive positive conversation that's out of your brand's hands, but around your brand. So it's about being positively and frequently talked about amongst large groups of people. How to drive fame. Again, turning over perhaps some 
uh, more accepted orthodoxy. Um, being famous is not the same as being different, okay? Actually, driving fame is about helping your brand stand out rather than helping your brand seem the most different on the market. So if you want to be a famous brand, think about how you can use your activity to help your brand really stand out, to be really easily thought of, brought to mind and chosen. And again, I'll talk about an example here uh, uh, from my own experience on Lurpak Butter. So this is the ongoing campaign about good food deserves Lurpak. Now, when we started to think about Lurpak, it was easy to default to what are its differentiating characteristics, its taste profile, its colour, both at a packaging level, the silver blocks, as much as the more lighter hue of yellow it is in comparison to many other butters and spreads. But actually, that leads to differentiation, but doesn't lead to any communications or campaigns that really stand out, that grab consumers' attention, that makes that brand easy to be brought to mind. So we went to something that seems a little bit more perhaps generic, perhaps a category benefit about butter making food taste great, but delivered in a way with an epic sense of scale and excitement that could really help the brand stand out. So it was about walking away from, let's find the USP, the differentiator, and thinking about actually how do we create communications, activity initiatives that really helps this brand stand out in the minds of consumers and help it get chosen more often. The next driver of fame is about consistency and coherency. I think if you want to be famous and you want to achieve fame, you have to be easily recognised. If you're not easily recognised, you're not famous. And I think to drive recognition, you have to be thinking about what are the things that are, we're always going to be consistently using and how do we build consistency and coherence. I think um, Johnny Walker is a great example of this. Over the last six years, they've um, stuck to a thought about um, male progress and stuck to a line, uh, keep walking. And they haven't deviated from that yet. Um, admittedly, they've delivered it through different executions and styles, but the core idea and the core assets and equity that they've created, they haven't walked away from, and the brand has benefited by uh, growing accordingly, which perhaps contrasts with brands that behave over the same time period much more erratically. So uh, 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 we'll create some consistency, some equity, but then walk away from it all too easily in short amounts of time. So in the same time that Johnny Walker has been talking about uh, keep walking, Guinness, another Diageo brand has gone from good things come to those who wait, bring it to life, made of more, which is kind of denting the recognition of their activity and the ability for that, build, for that brand to um, overperform and build, build fame. I think the other thing in terms of building fame and recognition is knowing the value of design. I think this is really important. Um, again, it's a point about making yourself easy to recognise, easy to bring to mind. I've chosen the Tropicana example here of what happens when marketers uh, all too easily walk away from some of the equities that they have created. So this was a change in packaging that was intended to help uh, further premiumise the brands that sailed through various pieces of research uh, with many ticks in boxes from consumers. But when it actually went into the real world, they immediately saw a drop in sales. They had sort of dented their ability to be easily recognised and the equity that they had created. And I think the thing is, it's not just being uh, knowing the value of design and making it easy for your brand to be recognised, but also the value of design makes it easier for your brand to be used and for you to fulfil the intent of consumers. So Virgin America stripped back uh, their platforms and sites to something that was a single site, responsive, little cross-promotion, delivered what consumers wanted, delivered on consumers' intent, key things there being the boxes that they needed to fill in. So next, I'm going to talk about uh, participation. So we move from um, purpose, penetration, uh, prominence, and now participation. And I think participation is interesting because it means giving people reasons to interact with your brand over and above purchase or transaction. So again, it's trying to think about going, okay, 
back to the purpose over and above the commercial interest. This is reasons to interact over and above transaction and purchase. Um, I think often when people talk about participation, we can be we can think in terms of um, giving consumers opportunities to participate, to do something that is frivolous, not needed, not of genuine utility, not fun, things that people think that because they can do it, they should do it. But I'm here thinking about participation in terms of things that are more meaningful. And I think this is driving perhaps a lot of our thinking around the need to develop services around our brands so that we can uh, drive frequency of engagement with consumers. So why is this important? Sustained growth over the long term, um, uh, which is associated with powerful brands and how they drive that growth, um, uh, is a function which is not solely driven by campaigns. Campaigns will give uh, you a short-term uplift, an immediate sort of hit. But if you want sustained growth over the long term, you must have um, opportunities to interact with the brand deeply and more frequently. Sustained growth coming from sustained engagement. How does this operate? Well, I think there's something really important about actually giving people opportunities to participate, um, gives opportunities to trial your brand. So I'm using iTunes here as an interesting one of giving people uh, on PCs the experience of the uh, Apple operating system in a lightweight manner that perhaps could overcome some of the fears associated with Macs being difficult to use. But there's another observation here which I think is incredibly important too. I think sometimes mistakenly, we think values drive behavior. But I think the reality is that behavior drives values, okay? And what I mean by that is going, consumers don't use the brands they like, they like the brands they use. If you can get people having some form of lightweight interaction or engagement with your brands, they will feel more positively predisposed to it. So it's like going, how do we drive the behavior rather than thinking about driving the value change? Let's think about the behavior change that we can give a nudge, uh, we can nudge people in the right direction of. The second thing which I think is important in terms of development of opportunities to participate in service design is just going, actually participation creates networks. It gives you the opportunity to start to create networks that allow you to market to bases of consumers in a uh, less expensive, more effective manner. It gives you a network to market to on a low cost basis. And I think that's something that every marketer that we engage with or talk to is interested in. How can I lower the cost of reaching consumers and development of services and opportunities to participate if they are compelling enough and offer genuine utility a one way of doing that of getting your brand in front of people large audiences at a cost effective manner the second thing is about um, participation is social and can help drive advocacy um, People like to do things, and the, the web is brilliant because it isn't just about consumption, it's about participation, it's about doing as much as watching, and people like to do things together, so that social experience uh, can also be a great uh, uh, driver of um, positive sentiment towards your brand and what it's offered. So I've used the uh, ALS uh, Ice Bucket Challenge here, driving advocacy and driving participation. Um, and then the last point on participation is just the data opportunities that it provides. It helps build power. Brands enha enhance their power by better using the data that they collect through giving people these opportunities to participate. Almost the cost of participation is the, is the data that the user ends up um, offering to the brand or the marketing team. So this I've used uh, Nike Plus as an example of a a much uh, richer understanding, again, of the intent of consumers rather than uh, uh, just at an inspiration level, you know, an idea of actual behavior and what people are doing to allow that brand then to further create more effective communications, activities, initiatives, and services. Lastly, last of the Ps is about developing portfolios. I think there's a, a, a really interesting thing where we live in a time where the opportunities of creating initiatives and activities uh, are greater than ever because they are cheaper to do than ever before. So rather than uh, being great brands, rather than being restricted to follow absolute plans, are more interested in creating portfolios of initiatives that they can uh, learn from. 
And why is this helping to boost their power? Well, um, it's impossible to guarantee success, no matter how much pre-testing of an activity or a campaign any brand or marketing team might do. When it meets the real world, like the Tropicana example, it can often uh, go wrong, or the outcome is often not as expected as the pre-test might have predicted. And it's much better to put stuff out into the real world in some limited shape or form and learn from it, learn from the reality rather than the exaggerated hothouse of research. So, you know, it's better to create portfolios and small initiatives than to um, perhaps waste money on research that doesn't tell you how things are going to play out in the real world. So, how to do this? We've been working with uh, Mondelez uh, in the gum category to help them pioneer uh, a more agile approach to their marketing. And rather than creating a uh, single strategy not to deviate from, creating lots of different little experiments, working from different insights about consumers, having a different uh, message and a different campaign at the heart of those activities, uh, leveraged in different cities around the world and look to see where the green shoots um, sprout and which campaigns then should be taken to scale. Do it in a compressed time frame, uh, helping them actually learn from the reality rather than learn in abstract. So make many small bets and scale success. Have that portfolio rather than just the overriding plan. And I think the great thing about online and performance marketing is back uh, to the funnel that um, Shane had previously referenced, is going, actually, we can start to take a portfolio mindset across the funnel as a whole. It doesn't need to always be at the point of conversion where we're thinking about A-B testing. Actually, how can we take that mentality of experimentation, of learning from actual behavior rather than inferences of behaviors from research? How do we push that further up the funnel? How do we use all the great abilities to uh, reach and engage consumers through digital channels? And how could we start doing more and more experiments that give us more robustness in our activities as we take them to scale? Um, the way to do it, though, is to do it in a way which is manage the risk. So rather than uh, um, uh, um, an underestimation of risk, I think it's still, we still live in a world where we know there's certain things that will work well that will give us a base level of performance, but actually and our budgets need to reflect that base level of performance. So this used to be a rule at Coke where of their marketing spend, 70% would go on activities that were foolproof, that were almost guaranteed to deliver return. 20% of the stuff which people strongly believe that would deliver a return, and 10% on the unknowns. And I think having that kind of split of budgets to allow you to start to develop portfolios of activities is going to be really important as you move from a, as brands and marketers move from a planning mindset to a portfolio mindset, which obviously cost of production and digital channels allows brands to do. So, this is the five P's of uh, powerful brands as we see them. These are the behaviors, these are the habits uh, displayed by those organizations that uh, disproportionately outperform the market. So have purpose, focus on penetration, build prominence or fame, create moments of, or opportunities of participation, especially in terms of services and genuine utility, and develop portfolios and not be too encumbered by the plans. Uh, and the, lastly, people always ask me about um, uh, uh, building London Strategy Unit and whether we follow any of these words of advice that we often uh, uh, give to our uh, clients. Um, and our purpose, I always like to tell people, is yes, we have a purpose, and it's to build a home for gifted oddballs. So I hope you've got a sense of, the, of our oddball nature in this presentation today. Uh, I have put the presentation on SlideShare. If you go to our website, you'll find a link to it with all my speaker's notes. Thank you for for listening to me today. Thanks very much. My name is Stephanie. I'm from Houston, Texas. My dad has an unusual job. He gets to live and work in space. He has to stay there for long periods of time. Yeah, I miss him when he's gone. I think if we could write a really big message, he would be able to see it from space. Probably tell him that I miss him and I love him.
thinking about him back home. He's seen so many amazing things up there, but I hope that this message was the most special.